Welcome to Tennessee's At Home Learning Series for Math. Today's lesson is for all our sixth graders out there. They're all children are welcome to tune in. This is the ninth in our series, so welcome back. I'm so excited. My name is Reggie Carruth, and I'm an assistant principal here in Tennessee schools. I'm so excited to be your teacher for today's lesson. Welcome to my virtual classroom. If you haven't seen any of our previous lessons, you can find them on the Tennessee Department of Education's website at www.tn.gov forward slash education. You can still tune in to today's lesson, though it may be more fun to go back and look at previous lessons since we may be talking about things previously we learned today. Today we'll be learning about dividing fractions by fractions using multiplication in math. Before we get started, to participate fully, this is all what you're going to need for our lesson for today. You need paper and pencil. Are y'all ready? Let's go. All right, students, let's review some vocabulary before we get started. So look at this problem. 42 divided by 6 equals 7. Take a minute to think about what the parts of this division equation is called. All right, so let's look at 42. Do you remember what 42 is called in this division equation? Correct, it's our dividend. All right, what about six? Do you remember what it's called? Correct, it's our divisor. And last, what about seven? Correct, that is our quotient. Or it's also our answer. Good job. We're going to now look at three statements. I want you to think about whether they are always true, sometimes true, or never true. Again, we're going to look at three statements. I want you to think if they're always true, sometimes true, or never true. I'm going to give you a second to look at this. Again, I, always want, I want to know if they're always true, sometimes true, or never true. Let's look at our first one. It says when two numbers are divided, the quotient is greater than the dividend. Is that always true, sometimes true, or never true? Correct. That is sometimes true. Because 2 divided by a half equals 4. So when we divide a whole number by a fraction, the quotient is larger. However, in our previous example, 72 divided by 6, it gave me 7. So 7 is not greater than 42. So it's sometimes true. What about B? When the divisor is less than the dividend, the quotient is less than 1. The typo there. Let me block that out. So again, when the divisor is less than the dividend, the quotient is less than one. Always, sometimes, or never true. Correct. That is never true. And last, when the divisor is the same as the dividend, the quotient is equal to one. Is that sometimes true, always true, or never true? Correct, that is always true. Good job. When the divisor is the same as the dividend, it will always equal one. So let's say if I had 12 divided by 12. What is that going to give me? One. Or if I had 11 divided by 11, or my 11 as my numerator and my denominator, it's also going to give me one. What if I had one half divided by one half? That's also going to give me one. So it's always true. So let's look at some word problems. I'm going to give you a second, and I want you to read this problem 
on your own. So Paulo and Amy each have three-fourths cup of feed left in their bags of chicken feed. Paulo uses a half a cup of feed each time he gives his chickens a meal. Amy uses three half cups of feed each time she gives her chicken a meal. How many meals can Paulo give his chickens? And how many meals can Amy give her chickens? Wow, that is a lot of information. Let's try to make some sense of this problem. Let's see who gives the chicken more feed. So let's, let me underline what I know. So I know that Paulo uses a half a cup of feed and Amy uses two thirds cup of feed. Each time they give their chicken a meal. So what do we know about this situation? If Paulo uses a half a cup of feed and Amy uses three halves cup of feed, what do we know? You're right, Amy uses more feed for her meals, so her number of meals will be smaller than Paulo's. Let's start by solving how many meals Paulo has left. What do we know about Paulo again? Right, that Paulo uses a half a cup of feed each time he gives his chicken a meal. So he has three-fourths bag left. How do we write this as a division problem? Correct, I should write it three-fourths divided by 12. Take a minute and model this problem. You can use a number line, an area model, or whatever helps you visually model this problem. All right, so let me start with modeling. So first, I'm gonna draw a rectangle and I'm gonna shade three-fourths of it. So I have a rectangle and I'm gonna shade three-fourths of it. Remember, your models don't have to be perfect, they just have to help you visually see what the problem is talking about. So here's a fourth, two fourths, and three fourths shaded. So I know that equals three fourths cup. Next, I think to myself, how many halves are in the shaded portion? So looking at my model, there is one half cup in the shaded portion, so that I know that that equals one meal. But wait, there's some left. I have this leftover piece here. So how much is left? Again, I want to know how much is left. I know I have this left. So yes, there is one fourth left, but what fraction of a meal is left? So yes, this is a fourth left, but what is that in terms of the meal? If this whole thing, remember, equaled half a cup, equaled one meal, what does this represent of the shaded portion? Yes, that we have half of a meal left. So this model represents one and a half meals. Again, because I have my whole meal here, and then I have half of that that's left. Good job. Now, let's look at Amy's information. Amy uses three halves cups of feed each time she gives her chicken a meal. 
She also used three-fourths cup of feed per meal. How do we write this as a division problem? Again, how can we write Amy's information as a division problem? Before I write that, I'm going to go ahead and label this Paulo's information so we'll know that all of this goes with Paulo. So to write this as a division problem, let me move this up a little bit. I will write it as 3 halves divided by 3 fourths. I want you to take a minute to solve this problem using a model. Remember, you can use a number line, area model, or whatever helps you visually model the problem. All right, so first I draw another rectangle. So I'm going to move this up so I can draw my next rectangle. Remember, our rectangles don't have to be perfect, just so we can help us visually understand the problem. So now I'm going to divide this up. So now I'm going to darken where one hole is. So this just going to try to make it a little bit thicker so we can see one hole. And so in that one hole, I've divided this into four equal parts. I have two more, so the rectangle should equal three halves. So now let me shade in my three-fourths cup that we know Amy uses. And I'm going to mark that because I know that that's three-fourths cup. And I'm also going to mark, because I know that this whole thing equals Amy's three halves cups meal. So now I'm going to start labeling my halves. So I have one half cup. two half cups, and three half cups. So Amy needs three half cups for one meal. Here's one half cup again, two half cups, and three half cups. Does she have enough to have one meal? No, she doesn't. What fraction does she have? Remember, the shaded part is what she has. So remember, our shaded part is what she has. Good. She has three sixths of a meal. So one, two, three, four, five, six, because remember, these are six. Three sixths of a meal. Or if I look at what's shaded versus what's not, that's the same thing as half of a meal. So Amy has enough feed for half of a meal. I would like to connect Amy's situation to how we can use multiplication to divide with fractions. To find out how many three halves are in a number, you can use two multiplication steps. First, find out how many halves are in the number. To do that, we can multiply by two. So I can take three fourths and multiply it by two. With three halves and multiply it by two. So multiply this by two and this by two. And this should give me six fourths. 
Then I can separate the number by halves into three equal parts. To divide by three, multiply by one third. So I can take six fourths and divide it into three equal parts. So I multiply this by one third. Which is the same thing as six twelfths or one half. All right, so let's connect this back to the model we drew. Why does multiplying by two tell you how many halves are in a number? Right, because there are two halves in every whole. Why does multiplying the number of halves by one third tell you how many three halves are in a number? Right, there are only one third as many three halves as halves, or one out of three. The fraction two thirds is called the reciprocal of three halves. So again, the fraction two thirds is called the reciprocal to three halves. A reciprocal is two numbers whose product equals one. So what we did was multiply by the reciprocal. Let's put it all together. So I had three, move this out the way. We had three fourths divided by three halves, three fourths times the reciprocal of three halves, which is two thirds, number right reciprocal. Let's think about to multiplying fractions. How do we solve this now? Yes, we multiply the numerator and then multiply the denominator. So three times two for my numerators is six, four times three for my denominators is 12. So my answer is six twelfths, or an equivalent fraction to this is one half. Good job, that was a lot. You guys did a great job. Let's look at another problem. I want you to look at this problem here. It says Tyrone has one and a half quarts of honey. He is pouring the honey into jars that each hold three-eighths quart. How many jars can Tyrone fill? Again, Tyrone has one and a half quarts of honey. He is pouring the honey into jars. That each hold three-eighths quart. How many jars can Tyrone fill? Let's start by trying to use multiplication to solve this problem. Then we'll draw a model to make connections. So I know my problem is one and one half quarts divided by three eighths. To divide, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So let's first change one and a half to an improper fraction. So I'm changing this to an improper fraction, which is three halves. Then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of this, which is eight thirds. Now I can apply the rules of multipl multiplying fractions by doing 3 times 8 as my numerators, which is going to give me 24. Then I can do 2 times 3, which is going to give me 6. That also keeps going to 4. So Tyrone can fill 4 jars of honey. I want you to take a minute and I want you to try to create a model that goes with this problem. All right, so one of the models that you could have drawn for this problem could look like this. This shows my one and one half, 
and I'm dividing into three eighths, and that gives me my four jars of honey. Good job. In these problems, we were trying to use what we already know about dividing fractions with models to connect to how we can now multiply using the reciprocal. So now let's move into you having more ownership of the work. Here's another problem. Let's walk through how to solve it together. Write this problem on your paper. I want you to write this problem on your paper. We want to solve the problem by multiplying by the reciprocal. So, so I'm going to write my two thirds and I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal of two fifths, which is five halves. Good job. So now I'm ready to multiply my fractions, my numerator times my numerator, so 2 times 5 is going to give me what? 10. 3 times 2 is going to give me 6. Good job. So another equivalent fraction to 10 6 is 5 thirds or I can write this as a mixed number, as one and two thirds. You guys are doing a great job. Now, I want you to do the next one and then we'll talk through it. Here's our next problem. Cause I know you guys can do it. We're gonna make it a word problem. This problem says it takes Francisco five six of a minute to upload a video to his blog. How much of one video can he upload in a half minute? Let me give you some time to do this. All right, so now let's set this problem up together. Our problem would now be one half divided by five, six. Now we can solve this problem and we can check it. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up my, my division problem to make it multiplication by multiplying by the reciprocal. So I have one half multiplied by the reciprocal of five, six. What's the reciprocal of this? Correct, it's six, six. So now I'm ready to multiply my numerators and my denominators. So one times six is gonna give me what? Six. 2 times 5 is going to give me 10. What's an equivalent fraction to 6 tenths? It's also 3 fifths. So Francisco can upload 3 fifths of a video in half a minute. All right, great work. Today we review dividing fractions by fractions. I hope you're seeing some connections to models and multiplication when we divide. You sure did do a great job. After the video, you have some practice problems that you can try on your own. You will find those problems at www.tn.gov forward slash education. Good luck, and I know you'll do your best. I really enjoyed learning how to divide fractions by fractions with you all today. Thank you again for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you on our next lesson in Tennessee's at Home Learning Series. Goodbye. My name is Cassie Stevens, and we are going to be creating together today. If you love creating as much as I do, you can find more videos just like this on my YouTube channel. I'm really easy to find. All you have to do is search my name, Cassie Stevens. Did you know that creating is all about making an optical illusion? So optical is another word for I, in case you haven't noticed, I have a lot of eyes happening right here. And an illusion is creating a little bit of magic.
So when you're drawing or creating something, you are making eye magic. You can actually show space in a flat piece of art. How could you do that? Let me show you today. Let's take a flat piece of paper and create the illusion of space and depth with a landscape. Begin by folding your paper in half, then take the open side of the paper and bring it back to the fold. Smoosh down the fold, flip the paper over, and again, take the open side, bring it back to the fold. I'm creating a zigzag folded piece of paper. Open your paper up, and on one side of your paper, near the top, but not quite, put a little polka dot. Then I'll do the same thing near the bottom, but not quite to the bottom. Now imagine what kind of jaggedy line might be for a mountain range. Draw that and then go ahead and cut it out. This will be a part of our landscape or a creation, a picture, a work of art that showcases the land. My landscape now has a foreground, the part in the front, a middle ground, and a background. I'm going to start to color the middle ground, foreground, and background. I'm using crayons. You can use any art supply that you like. But when you color, make sure to go ahead and fold it back together again to make sure that you're coloring or adding decorations to the correct side of the landscape. There we go. Now that my landscape is complete, I'm going to draw a shape of glue on the back and attach it to a background piece of paper that I will use for my sky. Cut off the excess paper and then decorate your sky any way you like, maybe with a sunset or a sunny day or a stormy afternoon. Now let's work on some things that we could add to our landscape to really help to show space and depth. I'm creating a group of houses and I'm cutting them out. Notice I made one big, one medium, and one small. I also folded that paper in half. That way when I drew and cut out my houses, I didn't get just one house, but two. Now spend some time with a little tiny pin or pencil and decorate each house. Think of ways how you could make each one different and unique, just like us. No two people are alike. So let's make a whole bunch of houses that reflect that. Each one different, unique, and amazing. Now, when you glue your houses in place to really help to show depth, think about where they might go. The big houses will go in the foreground because they are closer to us. They appear to be the biggest. Ones that are a little further away in the middle ground appear to be smaller in size. And those in the background look so teeny tiny, even though they're all about the same size in reality. Look at that, a cool landscape for you to create. 